do it a little bit in reverse order. We're going to start at the end and then we're going to go back to the beginning because there's an important point we want to cover here before we go into this passage that Paul makes. Let's start from uh, verse, verse 8 in chapter 13 of 1 Corinthians. Charity never faileth, but whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. Whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part. But when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part shall be done away. When I was a child, I spake as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. For now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. Now we know in part, but then shall I know even as also I am known. And now abideth faith, hope, charity, these three, but the greatest of these is charity. So this word here, but when that which is perfect is come, it's a Greek word teleos, and it means perfect or complete. And I want you to think about this. At that time, Paul is is writing this letter to the Corinthians. What is not complete yet? Yeah, they only had a couple, they had the Old Testament, okay. They had a couple of books, maybe some of the Gospels, but not, they didn't have the Gospel of Luke yet. They didn't have, a lot of the Gospels, uh, a lot of the New Testament they did not have yet, okay. So at that time, what what happened was, when, when uh, the Holy Spirit was given to the church, was that they were given truth in bits and pieces through speaking in tongues and an interpreter because they didn't have the whole scripture yet. So that what you needed for today, okay, the Holy Spirit would give someone the tongue to speak and someone would interpret it. And then someone would expound on it. And they also, prophecy was the same thing, that they were given these things because they didn't have revelation. They didn't have the book of the revelations. They didn't have all the teachings of Jesus yet written out. They had just a few pieces of paper here and there of what, uh, that they passed around of verses and and parts of, of that had been written down. But most of the Bible they didn't have yet for the New Testament. So they didn't have the complete word of God yet. It was still being written. But Paul says, when that which is perfect is come, when the, the complete word of God is here, the things that are in part will vanish. They'll be done away with. We won't need the speaking in tongues and the interpreting. We won't need the prophesying. So some of these gifts, when we go through the passage here, it's important to understand that some of these gifts that are being talked about were important at that time, but they are no longer instrumental for us today. Because we have the completed word of God, right? So let's, and you know, it's it's interesting. He compares these, these things to childish things. He says they're childish things. And you know what I get in my mind is, is uh, my daughter, Alicia, she has a bicycle, okay, that she rides around and has these two wheels on the side, okay? These trainer wheels, okay? And so these two wheels, they helped to keep her on the straight path, okay? And since they didn't have the entire word of God at that time yet, it is very easy for bad doctrine to come in. But if you see a sign, someone speaking in tongues, and then another person interpreting those things, then you know that it's from God. So they needed that at that time. These were training wheels to help them stay on the right path forward. And the same thing with prophecy at that time. These were training wheels that helped them to stay on the right path. Okay, now let's go up to, uh, let's go to chapter 12. We'll start at the beginning here. And we'll start from uh, verse, actually let's start from verse 4. Now there are diversities of gifts but the same Spirit, and there are administ- 
differences of administrations, but the same Lord. And there are diversities of operations, but it is the same God which worketh all in all. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man to profit withal. For to one is given by the Spirit the word of wisdom, to another the word of knowledge by the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another the gifts of healing by the same Spirit, to another the working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another discerning of spirits, to another diverse kinds of tongues, to another the interpretation of tongues. But all these worketh that one and the self same spirit, dividing to every man severally as he will. For as the body is one and hath many members, and all members of that one body, being many are one body, so also is Christ. Okay, so going back up here to verse, to uh, verse 5, where verse 4, I'm sorry, verse 4, where it says, now there are diversities of gifts. The word there, gifts, is charisma. And it's an ability given from God. The word there, gift, it's an ability given from God. Okay? The, the word, the next word that we get there is differences of administrations. Now this one is diakonia. This is actually the same word that normally gets translated as servant. Let's take a look at another passage that talks about, that, that uses this same type of word. Mark chapter 10, 42 through 45. Administrations. Mark chapter 10, 42 through 45. But Jesus called them to him and saith unto them, Ye know that they which are accounted to rule over the Gentiles exercise lordship over them, and their great ones exercise authority upon them. But so shall it not be among you. But whosoever will be great among you shall be your minister, and whosoever of you will be the chiefest shall be servant of all. For even the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. So among the Gentiles, the king who's in charge, people come to him to perform, to feed him, to serve him. Okay? But Jesus said, it's not going to be like this in my church. We're going to flip this thing around. The strongest among you, the smartest among you, are going to serve the weakest, are going to serve the lesser, okay? And so that's what, you know, a pastor's responsibility is, and a preacher's responsibility is to take the Word of God and to serve the Word of God to God's people, okay? So this, when it's talking about administrations, talking about that service, that, that ministry that we have to each other, the service that we have to each other. Now going on to the next, the next verse in 1 Corinthians 12, and there are diversities of operations. The word there, operations, is an ergaimai. An ergaimai. It's a word where we get the word energy from. It means to be active, to be doing things, to be participating in something. Getting what needs to be done, done. Okay? You see, not everyone, not everyone in the church is supposed to be uh, ministering to, to the congregation in the sense of preaching or in the sense of singing. Not every, it's not everyone's role. Okay? Not everyone is supposed to be administering in, in gifts. There, are, there is a need. And the Holy Spirit will decide who needs to do what. But there is a need for many other things in the church. And those parts are just as necessary. They're just as important. They may not be in the forefront, but whatever God gives you to do in the church... It's just as important 
as every part. So all of these are given, and it's the Holy Spirit who decides. It's not up to me, and it's not up to you, and it's not up to the pastor to decide where you are to serve in the church. It's up to the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit will reveal to you what your service is. The Holy Spirit will bring it about and show you what your role is in the church. Okay? And it may not be, it may not be in the forefront. It may not be something that's, that, that people covet or want. Okay? But we're going to get to that. We're going to get to that in a minute. Um, let's go to verse 7. It says, But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man to profit with all. Now the word there, manifestation, part of that word is the word shine, to expose. Okay? And the Holy Spirit, like I was saying, the Holy Spirit exposes to each and every one of us what our role is in the New Testament church, where we belong and what, what we should be doing. And it says that it's given to profit with all. Okay? Now, that word there, profit with all, it, it has two components to it. Um, one part of that word is sum, and the other part is ferro. Okay? Sum ferro. It actually sounds very similar to the word symphony. Symphony. If you've ever seen a symphony, you have the orchestra playing, all these different instruments playing together. Okay? You know, I like to watch to see who is who is playing the triangle. You know, they just have one simple job. They just have to make sure they hit the triangle at the right time. You know, if they hit the triangle at the right time, no one even notices. No one notices. Okay? But the, the, the whole symphony sounds beautiful. But if they hit it at the wrong time, everyone notices. <laughs> everyone notices. So, all of those parts are important. Every single part. And in the church, we work together. We work together with, based on the gifts the Holy Spirit has given us to accomplish God's work as a symphony. We, it's making music to the Lord. Let's go on to verse 13. It says, For by one Spirit are we all baptized into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and have been all made to drink into one spirit. Okay? So, the word there, baptized, of course, means to submerse, to be under, okay? Under the Holy Spirit, okay? So, it's the Holy Spirit that covers the church, to guide the church through everything it should do. And I'd like to go through and just... Let's go through some of the passages where it talks about the Holy Spirit. It talks about how the Holy Spirit would come after Christ. Um, let's go to Mark chapter 1, verse 8. We're going to start all the way back in Mark chapter 1, verse 8. And John the Baptist here is speaking. He says, I indeed have baptized you with water, but he shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost. Okay. So when Jesus comes on the scene, he will baptize you, the, these people who are following John and, and these believers. He said, he will baptize you with the Holy Ghost. He will submerse you with the Holy Ghost. Now let's go to Acts chapter 1, verse 4 and 5. And being assembled together with them, commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem. So Jesus is here with the believers. He's already risen again, and he's, he's speaking with them. But wait for the promise of the Father, which saith he, ye have heard of me. For John truly baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost, not many days hence. Okay, and then the Lord went up. He ascended to heaven. Okay, so let's go to Acts. You know what, actually, let's, let's continue on to uh, verse 8 and 9, same chapter. But ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost is come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem 
Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the earth. Okay? So you shall be witnesses to me, to all these places, everywhere. Okay? Well, some of them didn't quite get that message. Okay? And we'll see that a little bit later here, that they, they didn't quite get the full message that they should be witnesses to all of these places. We'll, we'll see that in a minute with uh, Peter here. But first, let's go to Acts chapter 2, verses 1 through 4. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of fire, and it sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. So we see that at the church at Jerusalem, this sign came. The Holy Spirit came upon them. Okay, the, the Holy Spirit was given to them. Well, why was the Holy Spirit given to them? Because Jesus went to prepare a place for us. And he left the Holy Spirit as a comforter to guide us in truth, to teach us, to, to show us all things. Okay, then we see in Acts chapter 2, going on to 32 and 33, Okay, thanks. Acts chapter 2, two verse 32 and 33. This Jesus hath God raised up, whereof we all are witnesses, therefore being by the right hand of God exalted, and having received of the Father the promise of the Holy Ghost, he hath shed forth this which ye now see and hear, Okay, and then let's continue on to uh, verse 38. Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of the Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. So he gave very clearly in the, in the right order, Repent, be baptized, and then you will receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Okay, so they were first to repent. The, it, the Holy Spirit is not available in this context for the unbeliever. So if you want to be part of God's church, first you need to come to that point. Okay, until, until someone has believed, who has repented and believed and put their faith on Jesus Christ, they are still dead in their sins. And the Holy Spirit cannot work in that. The Holy Spirit will only convict, only prick their heart to show them, to show them what Jesus did for them on the cross. But you have to repent first. You have to be baptized. Baptized. Water baptism is what Peter said. Okay? And then you will receive the gift of the Holy Ghost and that, you know, the, today, how that happens is when, after you've been baptized and the right hand of fellowship is extended, you come under the Holy Ghost with the rest of the congregation, okay? We see when the Holy Ghost, when the Holy Spirit came down on the church in Jerusalem, I don't see anywhere in Acts where it went back up. It stayed there with them. Let's, let's look at a couple of other times where the Holy Spirit came down on people. Let's go to Acts chapter 8 verse 14 through 17. Acts 8, 14 through 17. And what we have here, uh, just a little bit of background, okay? Paul, or Saul, at the time his name was Saul, he was persecuting the Christians, and many of them had to flee from Jerusalem, okay? They went into Judea and Samaria, Okay. Now, Samaria is part of Israel, but they follow a different, they, they don't worship at Jerusalem. They kind of broke off and did their own thing. Like we saw with the woman at the well in John 4. She was a Samaritan woman. Jesus went to Samaria. He said, I had need to go through Samaria to reach this woman. 
And he, he, the, the woman said, Jews and Samaritans, we don't get along, okay? Now, Samaritans are circumcised, okay? They're circumcised. They follow similar, very similar to the Jews, but they don't worship in Jerusalem, okay? They have their own way. And the mountain is what, is what she said. We worship in the mountain. And Jesus said, the time is, will come and now is that you will worship in spirit and in truth, okay? So now they're in Samaria, and uh, they, they heard the teachings of Philip about Jesus Christ, and many believed. I'm sure that perhaps that woman may have been there as well. Many of the people who came to the well that day may have been there as well. And they, they believed, and they were baptized. And then... Uh, it says, now, when the apostles, which were at Jerusalem, heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent unto them Peter and John, who, when they were come down, prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Ghost. For as yet he was not fallen, he was fallen upon none of them, only they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then laid they their hands on them, and they received the Holy Ghost. Okay, so we see here that uh, the Holy Ghost came down on this group of Samaritans to show to the people at Jerusalem that the church was also available for the Samaritans, not just for the Jews, okay? Like Jesus said, it's going to go to Judea, it's going to go to Samaria, and it's going to go to all the earth. Then we come to another, another passage. Um, let's go to... Acts 11, 1 through 18. Now, some background here. Um, Peter just came back to Jerusalem. He was in Caesarea. And at, at Caesarea, he, um, he met a group of people who were believers. Okay? And he, at first he was given a dream. We'll read about that in a minute that this, this blanket came down from heaven and it covered every, every unclean thing, okay? In, in Jewish religion, there are many things that are unclean, like pigs and bugs and, you know, the, the shrimp even. And it said this blanket came and covered all of these things. So we're going to see here the, the dream, and we're going to see that when Peter met this group, the Holy Spirit came down on this group as well. Okay, these were uncircumcised. These were Gentiles, okay? And so some of the people in Jerusalem were not very happy with Peter. And he had to explain himself. Why? Were you, why were you meeting with these Gentiles? Why were you meeting with these uncircumcised? And why did the Holy Spirit come down on them? Or what, what, what's going on here? And the apostles and brethren that were in Judea heard that the Gentiles had also received the word of God. And when Peter was come up to Jerusalem, they that were of the circumcision contended with him, saying, Thou wentest into men uncircumcised, and didst eat with them. But Peter rehearsed the matter from the beginning, and expounded it by order unto them, saying, I was in the city of Joppa praying, and in a trance I saw a vision, a certain vessel descend as it had been a great sheet let down from heaven by the four corners, and it came even to me, upon the which, when I had fastened my eyes, I considered and saw four-footed beasts of the earth and wild beasts and creeping things and fowls of the air. And I heard a voice saying unto me, Arise, Peter, slay and eat. But I said, Not so, Lord, for nothing common or unclean hath at any time entered into my mouth. But the voice answered me again from heaven, What God hath cleansed, that call not thou common. And this was done three times. And all were drawn up again unto heaven. And behold, immediately there were three men already come into the house where I was, sent, uh, where I was sent from Caesarea unto me. And the Spirit bade me to go with them, nothing doubting. Moreover, these six brethren accompanied me, and we entered into the man's house. 
And he showed us how he had seen an angel in his house, which stood and said unto him, Send men to Joppa, and call for Simon, whose surname is Peter, who shall tell thee words, whereby thou and all thy house shall be saved. And as I began to speak, <coughs> the Holy Ghost fell upon them, as on us at the beginning. Then remembered I the word of the Lord, how that he said, John indeed baptized with water, and ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost. For as much then as God gave them the like gift as he did unto us, who believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, what was I that I could withstand God? When they heard these things, they held their peace and glorified God, saying, Then hath God also to the Gentiles granted repentance unto life. So, we see the Holy Spirit, again, through this miraculous situation, and not of Peter's own doing. He just followed the Holy Spirit there, but he didn't lay his hands on them. Actually, he, you know, like he did in, uh, we see in Samaria, he laid his hands on them, and, and the Holy Spirit came down. He, he didn't even get that far. He just started speaking. And the Lord wanted to show him something. The Lord wanted to show him that the church would also go to the Gentiles. And so the Holy Spirit came down on them. Okay? And we, again, I, we never see where the Holy Spirit left and went back up. Okay? And there's one other passage, too, um, in Acts 19 that we'll look at. Acts 19. Verse 1 through 6. Now, I'll tell you a little bit of background here. Apollos, uh, he was one that had um, met, uh, that, that, that he was baptized by John the Baptist, okay? So he met John the Baptist before Jesus came to John the Baptist. And he had left. He had left already. Okay? So he wasn't around for when Jesus came on the scene. Okay? So he didn't know about Jesus. Actually, Priscilla and Aquila taught him about Jesus later. Okay? But he was going around and he was, he was uh, preaching the baptism of John. And he was uh, telling people, the kingdom of God is at hand. Be baptized. John the Baptist says it's at hand. Okay? And it came to pass that while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul, having passed through the upper coast, came to Ephesus, and finding certain disciples, he said unto them, Have ye received the Holy Ghost since ye believed? And they said unto him, We have not so much as heard whether there be any Holy Ghost. And he said unto them, Unto what then were ye baptized? And they said, Unto John's baptism. Then said Paul, John verily baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying unto the people that they should believe on him which should come after him, that is, on Jesus Christ. When they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul had laid his hands upon them, the Holy Ghost came on them, and they spake with tongues and prophesied. Okay, so we see here that that the, the proper you know, way for baptism is baptism in the name of Jesus Christ, right? And so the purpose behind this um, example uh, was, I believe, twofold. was one, to show us that the proper way of baptism is through in the name of Jesus Christ. And number two, this also shows us that, that Paul was an apostle, that, that he had the same abilities as the apostles. That he was, because see, there were, there were a total of 12 apostles to the people of Israel, and there was one apostle who was born out of due season, Paul, to the Gentiles, an apostle to the Gentiles. 13 apostles in total. Okay. So we, we see each time that the Holy Spirit came down, it's for a very specific reason. It's for a very specific person, uh, purpose. First, to show that, that uh, the church at Jerusalem, to give them the way forward when Jesus had left, to give them and to teach them in spirit and in truth, to give them power, to give them uh, what they needed to stick together as a cohesive unit and to be a church. It also came in Samaria to the church, to the church there to bring them together and to show to the Jews 
that this was also available to the Samaritans. Came to Caesarea, Caesarea to show that the church was also available to the Gentiles. Okay. But the, the Holy Spirit never left. And if you, you look back on the wall here, we've got a, a chart that shows the history, the Baptist history, of how the Baptist you know, uh, churches were started. Okay. The Holy Spirit never left. So when, you, when you're baptized, and you, when, after you believed, you've repented, and you've become baptized, and you're extended the right hand of fellowship, you're also under the Holy Spirit within the church. Okay? But it's the church. It's a, it's a corporate. The Holy Spirit was given to the church, and it's corporately held by the church. But it never went back up. It never left. It's still here with us today. So we don't need to be praying, Lord, baptize us in the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is here with us right now. We have access. We, we can access the Holy Spirit if we're in a New Testament church. Okay, so let's go back to uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 12. And let's go to verse 14. For the body is not one member, but many. If the foot shall say, because I am not the hand, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? And if the ear shall say, because I am not the eye, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? And if the whole, if the whole body were an eye, where were the hearing? If the whole body were hearing, where were the smelling? But now hath God set the members, every one of them, in the body, as it hath pleased him. And if they were all one member, where were the body? But now are they many members, yet but one body. And the eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of thee, nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. Nay, much more those members of the body which seem to be more feeble are necessary and those members of the body which we think to be less honorable upon these we bestow more abundant honor and our uncomely parts have more abundant comeliness for our comely parts have no need but God hath tempered the body together having given more abundant honor to that part which lacked that there should be no schism in the body but that the members should have the same care one for another. So he compares the church, the local church, to the human body. Okay? That the human body, we have many parts. And you think about it. Each day, the parts that we think about the most, like the hands, we use our hands a lot, right? We use our feet a lot. We use our eyes a lot, right? But if you cut off my hands, actually, I could probably still live. If you poked out my eyes, I could probably still live. But if you cut my heart out, I don't look at my heart. I don't think about my heart. I don't have to make it beat. It does its job. But if you cut my heart out, I could cease to live. I would cease to live. If you took out my lungs, I would no longer be able to breathe. I would cease to live. And there's probably, what, six, seven, I don't know how many organs between here. Maybe a doctor in here knows. But, you know, there's, a, there's an area between here and here. I have no idea what's inside of there. But there are many parts that work together and do their job that we don't really think about on a daily basis. We don't give those parts much praise or glory, but they do their job. And if you cut out some of those parts, your body might fail. So each part in the body of Christ is very important. Not just the parts that are up in the front, not just the parts that we see the most, but each part of the body is very important. We have need of each other. We have need of everyone who is in the church because each part person has a role to play that's important to the Lord. 
going on to 26 and 27. Now, ye are the body of Christ, and members in particular, and God hath set some in the, sorry, just 26 and 27, I, I started at the wrong verse there, and whether one member suffer, all the members suffer with it, or one member be honored, all the members rejoice with it. Now, ye are the body of Christ, and members in particular. Okay, so if if your um, liver isn't working correctly, you're going to be crippled. You're not going to be able to operate the same way. It's going to change how you walk. Okay? So that what I'm saying here is that each and every one of us are very important that, that we be walking in faith because we are part of this whole body. And if we're not doing our part, we can cripple the body. We can cripple the church here and the work here in Seam Reap. Not just that, he says, now ye are the body of Christ and members in particular. You know, the word ye, he didn't say the word we. He used the word, the second uh, person, plural. Okay, so he's saying, you all, okay, when he's writing to the church at Corinth, he's not including himself in that. The emphasis here is that this is not some invisible, universal church that everyone who's saved is just a part of. He's saying, you, the church at Corinth, you are the body of Christ at Corinth, okay? You are the body of Christ at Corinth. Now, Paul, he's part of a church in Rome. So he's part of the body of Christ in Rome. So he makes a very clear distinction. The, the emphasis there is on the local New Testament church, meeting together, people coming together, meeting together under the Lord. Going to 28 through 31. And God hath set uh, some in the church, first apostles, secondarily prophets, thirdly teachers, after that miracles, then gifts of healings, helps, governments, diversities of tongues, are all apostles, are all prophets, are all teachers, are all workers of miracles, have all the gifts of healing, do all speak with tongues, do all interpret. Okay, so his, his focus here, you know, he starts off with saying apostles, okay? So God has set someone apostles. Now, the requirement for being an apostle, let's be clear, the requirement for being an apostle, you needed to see and witness the resurrected Jesus Christ. If you have not witnessed physically the resurrected Jesus Christ, you cannot be an apostle, okay? There's a very limited purpose for the apostles, and that was they are to have witnessed Jesus Christ. They are also to be ambassadors, representatives for certain groups of people. So for the 12 tribes of Israel, you have 12 apostles. For the Gentiles, we've got Paul, who's the apostle for the Gentiles. There's no more apostles. That's it, okay? There's no apostles today. We don't need to pray to become an apostle today. So some of these things that applied to them at that time, you know, let's just be clear, uh, understanding all doctrine, that we don't need to pray to become apostles today, okay? But he continues on, and he says, uh, prophets. Again, we talked about the prophets, that there's no more prophesying after the completed word of God has come. We have all the prophecy we need. It's all there. If someone comes and they tell you, oh, I've received a new prophecy. Really? Let's go through the word of God. Does it agree with the word of God? Because we have the completed word of God. There's no more need for new prophecy. Now, there is a need for understanding. There is a need for discernment. There is a need for reading the word of God. Okay? There is a need for, for that. Uh, Thirdly, teachers. So that comes to teachers. After that, miracles. Then gifts of healing. Helps. 
governments, diversities of tongues. And again, we talked about tongues have already passed away with, with the word of God coming on the scene. Are all apostles, are all prophets, are all teachers, are all workers of miracles, have all the gifts of healing. So we cannot be all of these things. God will give us, the Holy Spirit will give us our role. Now in verse 31, I've heard this verse many times preached uh, very incorrectly and out of context. It says here, but covet earnestly the best gifts. Sometimes a, the teacher, the, the person expounding on the word of God will put a period there, but covet earnestly the best gifts, period. Like this is a command, like we are supposed to covet the best gifts. That is not what Paul is saying. He just got done telling us the Holy Spirit will decide to whom the gifts will fall. We have to read the whole sentence to get the whole context. If you look at the word covet earnestly, this actually this word has in the, the Hebrew, or sorry, the Greek, has a very negative context. The word is zelo'o. And it's the same, if we go back to Acts uh, chapter 7, Stephen was speaking before the high priest in the Sanhedrin. And as he's speaking to them, this is before he gets stoned, by the way, as he's speaking to them, he's talking about Joseph's brothers, how they were jealous of him, and they sold him into slavery. And this word gets used there. It says, and the patriarchs, this is verse 9, sorry, verse 9, um, Acts 7, verse 9. And the patriarchs moved with envy, sold Joseph into Egypt. Okay, so that's the same word there, moved with envy, is the exact same word used here in uh, 1 Corinthians Chapter 12, verse 31, but covet earnestly. What Paul is actually saying, he's misstating a matter of fact, that we tend to covet the best gifts. And then he didn't finish his sentence there. He says, and yet I show unto you a more excellent way. He's saying this isn't necessarily good or bad. He's just making a statement that we tend to covet the most prominent gifts, but I want to show you a better way. I want to show you a way that's even better than if you had the best gifts. That's what he's trying to say here. And that, that fits the whole context, and we'll see later on that same word gets used again. But again, he's saying it in a negative context. Um, chapter 13. Though I speak with tongues of men and of angels and have not charity, I am become as sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. He says, even if he has the best gifts, but he doesn't use those gifts in love for Jesus and in love for the body of Christ, the brethren then he is useless. He says, and though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains, but if I have not charity, I am nothing. And, you know, this is where I said earlier that, um, that Gomer... Brother Gomer had preached this morning and he was just walking all over my message because, uh, which is great. It's, it's great. If we are not fulfilling our gifts, our calling, our administrations, our purpose in Christ church, in love, in charity, it's the same as doing nothing. Whatever gift God has given you, we are to do that with love for the brethren. We are to do that with love for Christ. He says, uh, he continues on here, and though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned and have not charity, it profiteth me nothing. Charity suffereth long and is kind. Charity 
And here we get that word again. Envieth not. Envieth not. That's that same word that was in that previous verse that he was pointing out. We tend to envy the best gifts. But charity does not envy. It does not seek for something that doesn't belong to you. Charity vaunteth not itself. Charity is not puffed up, doth not behave itself unseemly, seeketh not her own, is not easily provoked, thinketh no evil, rejoiceth not in iniquity, but rejoiceth in the truth, beareth all things, believeth all things, hopeth all things, and endure all things. Charity never faileth, and then we get to these verses that we were looking at before. The prophecies, they're, they're going to fail. The tongues, they're going to fail. Okay? All of these other things can fail, but charity, and they, they will pass away, but charity is the most important gift from the Holy Spirit that we can have, the, that all of us need to, to have. And everything that we do in the church, we need to be thinking about the other people in the church and how we can be a blessing, how we can bless them, how we can help them. So that means we're going to, you know, when you do something out of love, when you do something out of love, you think of like two young lovers, okay? And the, the young man, you know, this, you've all watched movies, and he, you know, he's willing to sacrifice his life for, for this girl he loves. So you've seen the, the Princess Bride? Who here has seen The Princess Bride? No, no, okay. Well, any movie you watch, I mean, you've got, there's always the romance where, you know, the man's going to sacrifice himself for the girl he loves. And, you know, you, you'll be willing to give your best when you do it out of love. You'll be willing to give your best when you do it out of love. <coughs> It doesn't matter so much what particular gift or administration or role that the Holy Spirit has given you. I mean, it matters that you need to know what your role is, and you need to be doing that role. But what matters is not how prominent that role is. What matters is that you do that which he has given you with love. If, if you're not sure what your gifts, your ministry, your work is in his church, you can pray and you can ask him for the Holy Spirit to reveal to you, what is my role? Where do I belong? How am I to be a blessing to the church here in Seam Reap? <clears throat> but, you know, whatever the gift is, God wants you to use it to serve others, to benefit the church, to, to serve his people. So I'd like to give you guys a... Well, it, Brother Gomer spoke this morning about the judgment seat of Christ, okay? There was a church that came before the judgment seat of Christ. Now, th there are two different uh, judgment uh, thrones. There's a, the white judgment throne in Revelation we see where everyone's lost and saved will come and be judged of their sins. And if you're, if you're found in the book of life, then um, you will have eternal life. Okay, but this is, there's a, also another judgment seat called the judgment throne of Christ, where Christ, where believers go and uh, are judged based on what they've done. Have they walked by faith? Have they walked in love? What have you done? Okay, and then you receive your rewards based on what you have done. Well, this church came before the judgment seat of Christ, and... They're waiting for him to arrive. And while they're there, the, they, they reorganize themselves. So the pastor, he's up at the front. And then the deacons behind the pastor. And then all the singers behind the deacons. And then everyone else. Based on what they think, you know, the, how the wards are going to be given out. Jesus comes and he takes a seat. And he looks out among his flock. And he shields his eyes like this, looks, stands up to see in the back, and he says, Carl, come forth first. And it, the, the, the people in the front look around, and they're like, one, one person says, who's Carl? 
and a man comes from the back. He puts his arm around him and he says, some of you might not know his name, but let me tell you about Carl. For 30 years, he cleaned the toilets every Sunday afternoon after the services. He came in and he would sing a song to me and did it out of love for each and every one of you to make sure that you know, we have a clean church every Sunday. And no one noticed it, but I'm going to give him some recognition now because of what he did for me, for you. And then he, he calls it, he looks out and he says, Ah, Betty, you come here. Betty, she, she looked over the nursery every Sunday. She missed out on the church service every Sunday, had to get the recorded message afterwards, changing dirty diapers so that young parents could listen to the gospel, could hear my teachings. And he looks out and he says, Liz, please come up here. Liz, you might not all know Liz, but I know her well. We spent a lot of time together. She would get on her knees in her closet, pray for each and every one of you. Many times, her prayers led me to intervene for you on her behalf. Remember, John, when you left out, when you turned 18, you, had, you wanted nothing to do with me. You wanted nothing to do with me. You had heard the gospel many times, and you did not deserve to hear it one more time. The Holy Spirit had pricked your heart, but you turned away. But Betty, or but Liz, she prayed, and she begged me to just give you one more chance to send the gospel your way, send someone to speak to you. And it was that time that you turned your heart to me and came back. You know, I, I wonder if that day we won't be surprised at how God gives out the rewards. It won't be exactly what we expected. And so, do your gift with love for others. This is the better way. This is the more excellent way that Paul speaks of. Thank you.